Acting Robert Falcon Scott was born on June the 6th, 1868, in Devon, England. At just 13 years old, he set out to sea as a Royal Navy midshipsman. It wasn't long before he rose through the ranks and attracted the attention of the Royal Geographical Society. He was put in command of the 1901 National Antarctic Discovery Expedition. When he successfully returned back to England, having travelled further south than anyone ever had before, he was hailed as a national hero. In 1910, Robert Falcon Scott left Cardiff Bay in Wales aboard the Terra Nova for a trip which would prove to be both harrowing and full of tragedy. The expedition started in October that same year when Robert arrived in Melbourne, Australia. He was collecting his crew and gathering supplies when he received a telegram from Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. Beg leave to inform you from preceding Antarctic. Suddenly, the expedition had become a race. Robert needed to get moving, so he selected his team of 65 men, out of which 8,000 had applied, and set off for the Ross Ice Shelf. Twelve of the men aboard the Terra Nova were eminent scientists, sent to study Antarctica's unique biology, geology, glaciology, yes that's a real thing, and meteorology. They had brought with them high-tech apparatus including telescopes, deep water sampling devices, hypsometers, thermometers, and Robert Scott's tripod-mounted theodolite which had to be fitted with leather gaskets around the knobs and eyepiece to prevent frostbite on contact with the skin. The Terra Nova arrived in January 1911. Robert and his crew needed to unload the ship, so three caterpillar tracked motor sledges were used. They were custom built, and each one cost more than a Rolls Royce, which was around £1,500 each at the time. To put that in perspective, that was more than 10 times the average professional's annual wage. Many believed this would give Robert's team a technological advantage over his Norwegian rivals. One of the motor sledges immediately fell through the pack ice while being unloaded. Robert also bought 33 sledging dogs and 19 Mongolian ponies. Robert had been quietly sceptical on the motor sledge's reliability anyway. Two of the ponies also fell through the ice and were eaten by killer whales. The remaining two motor sledges managed to shuttle supplies to base camp. Very slowly, at a top speed of about three miles per hour. In the dry polar air, they constantly overheated, were pretty useless in the drifting snow, and required enormous amounts of fuel to run. When they finally broke down, the team just left them. The dog teams, on the other hand, were much more reliable pulling an average of 800 pounds, or 360 kilograms, each day. However, the dogs were hungry, they demanded food, and with dwindling supplies, Robert was forced to send them back to base camp. The team then had to manhole sledges up to Beardmore Glacier. But what of the ponies, you ask? Well, you know what happened to them. After having pulled around 450 pounds, or 200 kilograms worth of supplies on sledges made of wood, leather and rope. They were shot and eaten. Even Weary Willie, who wore special snowshoes made from wire and bamboo with leather fastening straps, was shot when the team reached Shampoo's camp on the 9th of December 1911. At this point, five members of the team were suffering snow blindness due to incaution. Most of the men were wearing goggles, but these kept frosting over so they would take them off only to be blinded by the sunlight reflecting off the snow. The solution was to have a piece of leather with a slit in place of the glass. This expedition was brought to you by Heinz Baked Beans, Huntley and Palmer's Sledging Biscuits, and Bass Brewery's Finest King's Ale. We've also got sponsorships from Fry's Chocolate, and a gramophone generously donated by HMV. But wait, that's not all! Burberry, Wolseley and Jaeger also donated clothing that totally didn't contribute to the misery faced by Robert and his team during the journey. You see, the Norwegians favoured Inuit style fur coats and long wolf skin boots. Robert's team however were all about the brands. Burberry gabardine jackets were lightweight and waterproof. The tightly woven fabric however did not breathe well, 
resulting in the underlying layers of clothing to become sodden with sweat. This soon caused the clothing to lose its insulating properties, and the jacket's lack of hood also left the neck exposed to the chilling air. On the 20th of December, Robert selected his four-man team for the final push to the pole. The journey was hard going. On the ice, the men would wear steel crampons. In drifting snow, they would haul their sledges on skis, which they had been taught how to use from a Norwegian ski instructor. Each day, the men were consuming just over 4,000 calories from a diet consisting of dried biscuits, chocolate, raisins, pemmican, and horse meat. The diet was lacking in vitamin C and essential fats. The journey was forcing the men to burn over 7,000 calories a day, resulting in rapid weight loss and a danger of scurvy. Each night the men slept in tents made from a green Williston canvas, which provided insulation and were propped up by six bamboo poles to form a pyramid shape. This design was effective enough to be used by polar explorers for the next 70 years. Inside the tents, the men slept in reindeer skin sleeping bags. Over time, the ice caused the bags to become wet and bulky. At night, they would freeze, forcing the men to have to prise the layers apart to get out. Despite all this, Captain Robert Falcon Scott was in high spirits. He was going to make it, right? He was going to be the first man to reach the South Pole. He couldn't wait to plant the British flag, crack open a beer and celebrate with the lads on a job well done. Right? 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 On the 16th of January 1912, the men spotted a black speck in the distance. They arrived to find a black flag tied to a sledge bearer, with the remains of a camp nearby. The Norwegians had reached the pole first. Robert Falcon Scott and his men planted their Union Jack next to the Norwegian flag left behind by Amundsen, and took a photograph to remind them that they were losers. Great God! This is an awful place, Robert wrote in his diary that evening, now realising he had 800 miles of dragging his equipment back in order to escape the Antarctic. For almost a month the men battled the polar winds, snow and ice. At night they would sleep in temperatures of around minus 40 degrees Celsius, or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Food supplies were dwindling. The men had lost around 25 kilograms or 55 pounds of body fat and muscle mass, making it impossible to keep warm. Edgar Evans was the first to succumb to exhaustion. He collapsed on the descent of Beardmore Glacier, hitting his head and dying at the glacier's foot. The remaining four men continued on, making camp at the supply depots they had set up on their first trip. At each one they discovered most of their cooking fuel had evaporated making it impossible to heat food and melt ice for drinking water. By March, the finesco boots made by the Sami people, of which Captain Oates wore, had lost their insulation, causing his feet to become blackened by frostbite, and then gangrene set in. On the night of the 17th of March, huddled inside their tents, Oates told the others he was going outside, and maybe some time. He walked out into the blizzard outside and was never seen again. The three men continued on for a further 20 miles north before a snowstorm halted their progress. Trapped in their tents, too weak and cold to advance further, Robert recorded his final diary entry on the 29th of March 1912. The end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write more. For God's sake, look after our people. In the end, Captain Scott and his brave companions fell victim to the merciless Antarctic wilderness, their bodies frozen in time as a testament to the indomitable spirit of exploration. Meanwhile, the remaining expedition members still at Cape Evans were waiting for the polar party to return. When there were still no signs of Robert, a meeting of the whole group decided that they should send out a search party. On the 12th of November, the party found a tent containing the frozen bodies of Scott, Wilson and Bowers, 11 miles or 18 kilometres south of One Ton Depot. Personal effects and records had been collected. The tent was collapsed over the bodies and a grave of snow erected, topped by a cross fashioned from Grand Skis. The party searched further south for Oates' body but found only his sleeping bag. 
On the 15th of November, they raised a grave near to where they believed he had died. Despite these tragic circumstances, there were incredible scientific contributions that came from the expedition. The Terra Nova returned to England with over 2,100 plants, animals and fossils, over 400 of which were new to science. They were able to study glaciers which had only been studied in Europe, providing baselines for current assessments of climate change, and made many other important scientific discoveries. Scott might have lost the race, but in his own words, it is the work that matters, not the applause that follows. Mum! John is going off round the world. Before tea? A million housewives every day Pick up a tin of beans and say Beans means Heinz. When will Johnny be back from going round the world? Ooh, not till well after tea, I suppose. We might as well eat his beans then. <laughs> I think I'll go round the world tomorrow instead. A million housewives every day Pick up a tin of beans and say beans